So the other day, I had to get a second flu shot. Long story short, I'm a bone marrow transplant patient. I'm on a large amount of immunosuppression with lung conditions. So, as recommended by my doctor, leading hematological bodies and scientific evidence, I got a second shot to increase my chance of developing immunity to the flu to save my life. So I posted up this picture to encourage other people to vaccinate. And apparently it got shared by some anti-vax pages or groups because I was flooded by a wave of these guys. I, I mean, I got the usual keyboard warriors and keyboard doctors diagnosing fools over the internet better than IBM Watson. But I also got this. A bunch of dudes started attacking my looks as if that undermines my credibility to talk about these things. Okay, let's forget about the fact that half of these dudes are hiding behind objects in their DPs. How is my having cancer, having been given a 10 to 20% chance of surviving, how is my relapsing being told that palliative care might be the best option? How is my suffering from a chronic debilitating illness that's probably gonna take my life at some point and me suffering from so much more my fault. I mean, I can't help how I look. I kind of predicted or stopped any of these things. And how does any of this ruin my credibility? I'm at the forefront of tumor vaccine research. I've graduated from a research medical degree. I'm about to go into a PhD. I'm studying medicine. And last year I started up this health tech startup that's worth seven figures now and will hopefully go on to save lives. I never claim I'm a doctor. I always tell people to ask their doctors when I give out medical advice as is required. You'd think that would, you know, make me trustworthy on this, right? Why does a wellness blogger who flogs vitamins and supplements, who's never spent a day in science class, get more credence than someone like me when it comes to health? I mean, if that's your criteria for who you trust when it comes to health stuff, maybe you should visit Pornhub for your next consult. I hear there's lots of doctors and nurses there. Not that I'd know, I swear I've never been on those sites. Uh, why am I covering up for this? My mom doesn't watch my vlogs. <laughs> but just in case, I have never visited those horrendous sites and I'm offended that you'd even think I did. Love you, mom. Please watch my vlogs. But yeah, I mean, some of these comments are just disappointing. A few years ago, they would have gotten to me personally. After getting out of treatment and going from looking like this to this, I was super self-conscious and I suffered from social anxiety. I mean, I was afraid of going out to eat lunch with people I'd known since I was three. It was that bad. But I overcame it with the same mentality that got me through cancer. I took a step back asked myself why I was so unhappy and realized from that objective perspective that A, most people weren't thinking anything bad of me at all. I mean, those looks that I was getting from people, most of them were probably imagined, but even if they were looking at me, most people won't think anything weird of me at all. But B, even if people were staring or if friends were thinking, what a freak, why was I trying so hard to please these judgmental people I wouldn't want to be friends with? and putting myself down because of what they were thinking about me. It didn't make sense. I mean, every one of us has these insecurities about ourselves and every one of us spends effort trying to look cool and to impress people. This mentality could help anyone watching this overcome that too. I mean, it didn't happen overnight, but with this two-step process in mind, knowing that in a few weeks time, I could rewire my brain and habits to remold myself into someone who was happy with themselves, I eventually got to a point where I'm at now more self-confident, but more importantly, more happy with myself. But at the same time, I've been depressed and anxious in the past. When you're in those modes, you can't be as objective or see things as clearly. Everything becomes more personal and you can't help but be more affected by these things. The main reason these comments got me down was because I know that there are others out there who would be affected by shit like this, who may not be able to bounce back. I was disappointed. As a general rule, just try and be kind wherever you can because you never know what someone's been through. But yeah, as I was struggling to keep up with the obscene comments and the non-scientific ones, a wave of pretty awesome people came to my aid and helped me fight the anti-vaxxers in a meme war to end all meme wars. Thanks for having my back, guys. I was getting quite overwhelmed trying to respond to every claim of how vaccines suck and don't work as best as I could with evidence and science, but I'm... I'm, I'm fairly sure we've won this one. I will say though, there's no need to clap back at those assholes comments by going after their appearance, even if some of them resemble the offspring of an elephant. Okay, look, I won't go there, but nah, there's, there's a famous quote that applies here. Don't argue with idiots. They'll bring you down to their level and beat you with experience. 
No, but what we should be trying to do is trying to educate these people. I've read a few papers that advise us on how to communicate with anti-vaxxers. They all seem to say that confrontation and calling people names just makes people dig in further. I mean, you can't help it sometimes. I couldn't at some points too, but that's completely fair. And some people, they're so entrenched in this cult-like thinking, you'll never get them to change. But instead, if we provide reason and lace facts with things that most people can understand, such as anecdotes, examples, and stories, you're more likely to convince people to change. It's sad that fringe groups based on hate and other products of ignorance seem to get as much airtime as scientists, but we've got to come out as the less crazy, more rational, and, and also more passionate about helping people's side in this debate. I mean, we definitely are that. We need to market ourselves better. I think. So for the rest of this, I thought I'd get back to some common threads or themes of comments that seem to get shared around by many anti-vaxxers. I've already done a video on the flu vaccine demonstrating how it can't possibly give you the flu, how it is safe and effective, and how it's actually quite easy and important to get. You can check that out at youtube.com slash Nikhil Autor. But the most common arguments you see from anti-vaxxers in general are that A, vaccine inserts, the safety label that comes with vaccines, say that you can get a shopping list of all these certain illnesses because of it. So vaccines, therefore, must cause all of these and suck. B, that vaccines haven't had a double-blinded study done on them. Why is that? C, that big pharma profits and funds lots of these trials. How can we trust them? And D, that all the additions to vaccines make them dangerous. Well, let's deal with A first. First off, vaccine inserts or vaccine court payouts, or reports to vaccine bodies aren't medical evidence. They're safety labels. They're ways to reduce expenditure trying to tackle every legal dispute. And in the case of the latter, even increased gas post-vaccine has been reported to VAERS, apparently. Inserts say what can potentially happen, and if we dive into the numbers and real evidence, we see that vaccines save way more lives than they harm. Yes, vaccines can cause side effects, and yes, there's a low risk of getting some severe side effects as a result of them, but these risks are minimal. The chances of you getting gilly, gil, gil, gilly, gil, GBS, I can never say that one properly, that lies between one to two per million doses. Anaphylaxis or allergic reactions, that's 1.3 per one million. Febrile convulsions and the vaccine most associated with them in the population most likely to get them, children, are 3 in 10,000, and they're associated with no lasting damage or increase in mortality as well. On the other hand, as a senior, you have a 1 in 106 chance of dying from the flu if you get it. Overall, there's a 1 in 600 chance of death if you get the flu. Incidence of the flu was much higher prior to vaccinations as well, and we seem to be getting worse seasons as we come around. Basic math done by people much more trained in statistics than you or me show that it's safe. And in terms of efficacy, we know that it does work because of lowered incidence through studies and because we monitor them. Yes, it doesn't work in all people, in all individuals. Flu vaccine efficacy in an individual ranges from 40 to 60% per year. That's why it was important for me, who's at higher risk, to get two. But if enough people vaccinate, there's no way for the flu to spread and we're all safer for it. In regards to B and C, contrary to popular belief, there are double-blinded studies done on vaccines prior to release. We don't do these post-licensure and after vaccines hit the market because it's not only unnecessary, phase one to three studies show you efficacy and safety, but also because it's unethical and unsafe to do so. Vaccines work by not only increasing their efficacy in you, but also by reducing the likelihood for disease to spread. Based on the basic reproduction number of a disease, how many people you're gonna infect while suffering from them, you need to get one minus one over R zero people vaccinated in a uniform manner. Otherwise, outbreaks can occur. The key is in a uniform manner that's spread out along populations. We've already seen measles resurge from eradication, zero cases, to now hundreds in areas of lower vaccination these last few years. Anti-vaxxers have been named in the top 10 global health threats to the world by the WHO. Not only would we be putting innocents at risk of this disease, we'd also be more likely to make it spread by having populations who didn't get the vaccine done by doing these RCTs post-licensure. 
that we don't even need. Some vaccines, like the seasonal flu, do go through faster of vaccine approval because these viruses mutate fast, but they still get tested for safety in humans prior to release, and the amount of study we do on them post-market release is insanely huge and is statistically more powerful than RCTs. See the idea that Big Pharma makes so much from these. Well, you're right about one thing. Big Pharma are scumbags. But as I've just demonstrated, this is a very regulated industry. Most research post-licensure is done by regulatory or government bodies, universities, not-for-profits, and clinicians. There are 10 million medical researchers out there. This would be harder to hack and corrupt than the blockchain. And every country, including our enemies, conclude the same thing. Vaccines are safe and effective. And also, this market is much smaller than you'd expect. You want to talk financial motive? Think about it this way. The vaccine market is worth 50 billion globally a year, which may seem like lots, but the aged care sector, which is who my startup serves, is worth 400 billion to the US alone. Organic foods, which have, which have no demonstrable or scientifically valid hypotheses for being healthier, and the alternative medicine market is gonna be worth over 500 billion by 2025. Unlike vaccines, these have no requirement for proof or evidence. It's super unregulated. And in the case of cancer, alternative medicine is actually shown to increase rates of death by those who use them by a factor of 2.5 to 5.7. I've almost been killed by bad alternative medicine advice in the past, and I'm doing a campaign against some of them soon. The thing about alternative medicine, though, is that some of them may well work. And a lot of them is just good, healthy advice. Practitioners in that space, they spend hours with you, where doctors can only spend 10 minutes. Though I've nearly been killed by alternatives, and many, including some of my friends, have been, things like a dietitian and a massage therapist have also changed my life in the last year. I have friends alive today who are only here because of cannabis. My company's app is actually using AI to power medical research into various aspects of wellness that currently don't have much evidence on them and is filled with woo. Check out that here if you're interested. It's called Centered Around You. It's a win-win for both sides. If alternative medicine does work, this will be able to show correlations via observational studies between better health outcomes and alternative medical use. If they don't, then it'll show that once and for all too. All in an automated, easy to use, and cheap to conduct manner. But getting back to vaccines, people also harp on about how various additions to vaccines make them dangerous. Now, there's too many myths out there for me to break down each and every one of these individually, but the most common is formaldehyde, which has been recognized as a potential carcinogen, something that causes cancer. Now, formaldehyde is used in vaccine preparation and residues can be left in doses. We're talking about less than 0.2 milligrams per dose. There's 50 to 70 times more in baby's blood vessels than this. Similarly, there's 50 times more formaldehyde in an apple Anti-vaxxers would then say, well, that's ingested. We're talking about injected formaldehyde. Well, formaldehyde in the blood ends up having a half-life of 1 to 1.5 minutes before it's broken down and converted to essentially carbon dioxide. There's no correlations between vaccines and cancer. No keyboard doctors. You can't say that vaccines cause my cancer. No doctor can tell their patient exactly what caused their cancer, except maybe mesothelioma patients. How can you, Carol, who has no qualifications on this matter and who can't explain the basics of immunology or cancer development, assert that? Anyways, I've gone on for far too long now. I guess what I wanted to say was thanks for the support, guys. Don't worry, I'm okay, but please try and be kinder over the interhighway. And finally, for those of you on the fence, I hope that this shows you why vaccines are safe and effective too. Links to all my stuff are coming up. My startup is called Get to Sleep Easy. We're developing, you know, a couple of medical devices that will hopefully keep people at home safer. We've got a device that converts any bed into a hospital bed for a few hundred bucks, smart sensors underneath, which can detect rates of falls and pressure sores and send alerts to nurses and loved ones when these happen. That's our hardware arm. The software, as you've heard about, is called Centered Around You. But yeah, be sure to check out my other blogs and vlogs too, including my series called Medical Facts, where I break down a lot of alternative medicine theories and see which ones do have merit and which ones don't. All right, anyways, peace out. My name's Nikhil. I'll see you soon.